Ladies and gentlemen, it is now official. We are now in the beginning of the end phase of this stuff here. This is cash which will no longer exist in the future. And this report here, which I've been talking about uh, earlier this week that I would get out for you as soon as I could, details it all. So this is gonna be a slightly longer video than usual and a little bit more detailed, but we are going to go into all of this report, which is the digital pound. So this is from HM Treasury, so it's the UK. But if you're not in the UK, please pay careful attention to this just because it's not your country because all of the countries are going to follow almost and exactly the same model. So this is what we're going to look at today. And this, by the way, I don't even know how many hours it took me to read through, not just this, but also the three reports that were connected to it. Because you see, they're very clever. They put out one report, but then they'll add these two or three other reports, a technical working paper and this and that. And you've got to read it all to really put the pieces together. So I was pretty, I wouldn't say I was shocked by it because it was stuff that I've already been talking about previously, which, uh, you know, people refer to as a conspiracy theory, a central bank digital currency, and the measures that they're going to take. This is, mark my words, dystopian in nature. This is the official document from HF, from the UK government, as it were. However, let me just start by <laughs> telling you it's not exactly from the government. This is where we have a slight twist in the story. So with that said, let's get into it. This is gonna be a special report today. And let me just say, I don't think you're gonna like what it has to say. We're going to begin then with page three of this consultation paper, although it is nothing of the sort. It is not a consultation at all. It is a declaration. It should be called a declaration paper. The digital pound, a new form of money for households and businesses. That should be an exclamation mark, not a question mark. Now here's the thing I noticed right away. I noticed the emblem here and I said, hold on, that isn't the government emblem. That is the royal family, is it not? So just for those people who are gonna say, no, no, you know, this is another conspiracy or whatever, I've actually pulled up the royal emblem of the UK, the royal family, um, QE2 coat of arms. We can even see it on the gate of Buckingham Palace. So let's just look at that for a moment. You'll notice the Latin is missing from most of these, but we can, here we go, we can pull it up here, if you can see it in the right-hand side of the screen here. And my Latin isn't great, but it's, uh, you can see this here, Dieu et mon droit. Now, let's look at this paper again. Hmm, hold on, that is exactly the same logo. And then we actually read here, it says, presented to Parliament by the Economic Secretary to the Treasury by command of his Majesty. So this was presented to Parliament by command of the new King Charles, which you may find very unusual. Why is the King involved in this digital currency paper? And why did he command that this, and you can see here as well, this is crown copyright. This is not government copyright. Let's go to page five here then and let's get this started. A UK central bank digital currency, a digital pound, would be a new form of digital money. So again, this isn't just taking the existing pound, which is mainly digital in nature, and using this in a different format. No, this is a new form of digital money for use by households and businesses for their everyday payment needs. Now they say here it would sit alongside and not replace cash, but then you see a lot of contradictions to this statement as we go through the document. And even though they say that this is just you know, a consultancy and they're thinking about it, this statement here says the Bank of England and HM Treasury judge that it is likely a digital pound will be needed in the future. They also say such things as it's too early to commit to build the infrastructure, but we know that is not true. We know they are already building the infrastructure. Another point to note is that they say that this is a four month consultation 
period. So they stealthily launched this in February, which is why I didn't even see it because there was so much distractions going on. So that takes us to March, April, May, June. So actually by next month, we've only really got three or four weeks, this will be complete in terms of this stage. Part A then is their proposal and we'll go to page eight here where they talk about this is a retail CBDC designed for everyday payments by households and businesses. Seems pretty straightforward. That's what we've got right now, isn't it? With a digital pound. That contrasts with a wholesale CBDC, which would be used to settle high value payments between financial firms. So there is gonna be a slight difference between the retail and wholesale, which we will have a look at. Private money is typically a claim on a private commercial bank in the form of bank deposits held by households or businesses. But central bank money is financially, here's what they say, risk-free in the sense that there is no credit, market or liquidity risk. Well, we know that is absolutely not true. So that is the first lie that they have put in this paper among a lot of other lies that we'll find throughout. Of course, the central bank money has risk. It has to carry risk. It is a fiat currency with no backing. Now, the next thing I wanna show you then is chart A. So this is all about the war on cash and how cash payments have declined while card use has accelerated. But if you look at the chart here, you can see that card payments are only actually 58%. Other will be some sort of bank transfer and other, other payments, but it could also be people, and this is what they don't say deliberately, this could also be people going into branch and doing some sort of a gyro payment or something similar to that over the, the counter at the bank. So it's not as simple as all of this is digital payments and only 15% is cash. Some of this 27% could also be in-person payments. So I would say it's more than 15% cash. It would be more like 20% in terms of physical um, uses. Around 1.2 million adults in the UK do not have a bank account and around one fifth of people name cash as their preferred method of payment. Okay, let, let me just read that again. One fifth of people, i.e. 20% of people name cash as their preferred payment method. They go on to say UK authorities are committed to ensuring continued access to cash. Yeah, they say that now, but where have we heard that before? We've heard this a lot of times in the past with other countries. Look what happened in Nigeria as a prime example, where they were also committed to ensuring the continued use of cash. They go on to say, but while, but whenever you see a sentence starting with but, um, there you go. But while we ensure continued access to cash, we also have to recognize that it cannot be used in digital transactions, which are becoming an increasingly important part of daily life. Again, that statement doesn't really make any sense. They are basically just, they have to make these digs all the way through about cash, just like during lockdown periods, they said that it was cash that was spreading a certain virus around and that everyone should stop using cash. Then they went on to talk about how only money launderers and drug dealers are using cash and all this other stuff. But actually, they said it themselves in their, in their statistic there. 20% of people still use cash and prefer to use cash. Now here's where they come into some form of justification. If current trends continue, the public's access to or use of central bank money will diminish and the monetary system could become fragmented, posing a risk to monetary and financial stability. So this is where they are justifying their reason for actually creating this digital currency. They are saying that the way things are going is posing a risk to stability of the country and of the country's finances. Well, actually, this is not true. It couldn't be further from the truth. The way we are going is actually, is actually making, especially if we went on to a digital currency that was backed by a, a real asset like gold, that would stabilize 
everything. It would stabilize finances and it would also slow down inflation so that the bank isn't manipulating inflation and creating inflation, which remember is a tax on all of us. They also explain how if they don't do this, it would pose a risk to competition and diminish the incentives for longer term innovation. No, what they're actually saying here is that digital currencies or something like Bitcoin or, or some of these other things that are coming out would create competition for them and for their monopoly. That is what they are really saying here. And as we go on to this chart here then, I wanna just draw out a couple of points as we go through. So their model for the digital pound, privacy protected like for cards and bank accounts, but it's not going to be anonymous. So everything you do will be tracked. There will be no more anonymity. They also say it will be seamlessly exchangeable with other forms of money, including cash and bank deposit. This raises a really interesting point, which I'll mention more later on. But how exactly are they gonna make this transition from commercial bank deposits into this CBDC? Surely that would create a hyperinflationary scenario for that period of time. Are they going to just, because it doesn't make any sense. Remember, this will be a new form of money. So are they going to double the money supply in order to match what already exists? Or are they gonna do something more nefarious? What if there's a collapse of the pound? You know, one of these situations I've talked about where on a Friday, you get an announcement from the prime minister that, oh, there's this bad situation, but oh, don't worry, we're gonna be working through the night to resolve this. And then of course, Monday's a bank holiday, it always is, and, and these things. You look at every bank that collapses in every situation. It's always on a Friday, every time, even First Republic was on a Friday, bank holiday on a Monday, and then, you know, all this other stuff they do. So they're not clear at all on how this is gonna work, and even the bank, deposits, you've got to remember, you've got central bank, you've got commercial banks, all of these, all of this money that you've got at these commercial banks, how are they going to flow into this digital currency? And that's where we talked about before, where I said, they're going to set a limit on it. They're going to set a very small limit. And actually, that's exactly what they say. The exact amount that I said, which was 10,000 pounds, is in this report for 10 to 20,000 pounds. We'll get into that because again, very, very worrying. Another thing to pay careful attention here is that there will be no interest paid on your money in the central bank. So right now, if you have money in the bank, you will be getting interest on it. Well, not with your central bank digital currency, no interest will be paid to you whatsoever. What else do they say exactly underneath? Limited amount per user, at least initially. Another line that was worrying was this one. End users would interact with these wallets rather than directly with the bank. So as I also mentioned before, my theory was that they would cut out the commercial banks because they don't want the competition. And that is what it seems as though this report is saying. They then talk about privacy and protection. And they say that the digital payments account for the majority of transactions today. These generate personal data, which is held by users. Payment providers, such as banks, to identify users in order to prevent fraud, money laundering, and financing of terrorism. Okay, so we know this, this is pretty common. But they go on to say here, like current digital payments, the digital pound would not be anonymous because the ability to identify and verify users is needed to prevent crime. So key word here, the digital pound would not be anonymous. So it doesn't matter what you purchase, even if that's a bunch of flowers or a bar of chocolate, nothing would be anonymous, which is where my next part of the theory comes in about not just the digital currency, but where they start tracking and linking this to carbon and other sort of forms of social credit scores. Again, I'm not 100% certain on that. That is my sort of wild card theory because it just makes sense that they would do that. Why do they need to bring all this about unless they are going to start linking it to carbon and some other you know, metrics here? 
We know we're heading into this dystopian world. It's a fact. It's all over the WEF website. All of the reports, everything that the different countries and world leaders are signed up to with the exact dates of implementation are all over the website. So we actually know how they're going to get there. We just don't know the, the specific pieces of what they're going to implement because if they tell us beforehand, people will hit the streets. But what they do is they wait until there's some sort of a distraction or there's something in the media that's you know, useless information to us, but they blow it out of proportion and put it on 24 seven. That is when they start implementing these things so that you don't notice it. Just like in February with all the distractions, I didn't even notice that this report came out. And if you want even more proof of this around the carbon aspect, let's look at the next paragraph here. The digital pound would be designed to support the governments and the bank's commitments to mitigate climate change. The government is committed to reaching net zero. How on earth they're gonna do that, I have no idea, but net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 20. 50. So although I can't be certain, I'm fairly confident that they are going to implement some sort of carbon aspect to this digital currency. I just don't see why they would put so much work into this unless they were going to bring in more measures and use it in other ways. And of course, we have the roadmap, the three phase roadmap here. Uh, let's look at this. So phase one, two and three. So phase one, research and exploration. So all this has now been completed. And I've also read the, cons so this is the consultation paper. I've also read the technology working paper as well as two other papers which are connected to this. And nothing fills me with very much confidence. Phase two then is estimated 2023 to 2025 or six. But where are they saying phase three that this will actually be built? It's 2025, where you'll see the live pilot tests and then a launch decision. Do we launch a digital pound? Hmm, hmm, I wonder if they will launch a digital pound. Page 20 then is the other aspect I mentioned previously. Again, this was just a sort of wild forecast and that was around a digital ID. And we can see here, innovative cryptography can also be used in novel digital, here it is, digital identity solutions. These can enable users to prove their identity. Again, why do you need to prove your identity when you're buying a chocolate bar from a shop? I mean, I really don't know or an attribute of their identity, for example, that they are over 18, without having to share all the personal identity data in an ID document. Well, look, what, what's wrong with that? If you, I remember, you know, if I were to go to the, the supermarket and buy some beer or something, and I looked younger than 18 or 21, whatever they go by these days. So I, I always had my driving license with me or a passport if I needed a passport, but driving license, it worked just fine. You keep it in your pocket, you show them your ID and that's that. Why does it need to be digital? So what you've got now is carbon and social all rolled into one. In fact, you have three carbon, social, and the digital ID. Box B then talks about forms of money. And again, this is the next part of the lie where they talk about this as if it's money. It is not money. It's so far removed from money. It's not even a fiat currency or even the world reserve fiat currency. You have real money. You then have the world reserve fiat currency. Then you have a fiat currency pegged to the reserve fiat currency, and then you have a digital currency. I mean, this is ridiculous now, but uh, the propaganda runs deep. So what do they say? Money must satisfy three criteria. Uh, incorrect. That is not true at all. Money must be durable, portable, divisible, uniform, limited supply, and accepted by public if we just use those six. But what are they saying? They're saying it must be a store of value. Well, this isn't a store of value, a medium of exchange, correct, and a unit of account. So really they're missing half of the other metrics here and they have to miss the other metrics because they can't fulfill on those things with 
a digital, it's like this calculator here. Just because I type in one trillion dollars into that, it doesn't mean that I have a trillion dollars on this calculator. They're just numbers on a screen, which is exactly what this is with a digital currency. It's just numbers on a screen. It isn't this stuff here, cash and you know euros or dollars I've got here as well, but this is British. It is not this stuff. This is, and even this is, is, is not real money either. That is why I always say real money is gold and, and silver because it is, it fulfills upon all the metrics of money. But what we're going into now uh, is dystopian and it's just, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. So how on earth they can claim that this digital currency is going to be a store of value, I have absolutely no idea because there is no value behind it. Of course, they go on to say new forms of money. Again, they're talking about stable coins. Stable coins are also not money. They are digital tokens. Stable coins used as money-like instruments should have standards equivalent to those that apply for commercial bank money in relation to stability of value, robustness of legal claim, and the ability to redeem at par in fiat. So here we go. They know, because they're using the word here, fiat. They know that it's not real money, and they uh, slip up here by using the word fiat. But the other thing they are not mentioning is that commercial bank money isn't stable or isn't value, at least if you had something like let's say for example for the bitcoin lovers out there if you had something like bitcoin at least it has a limited number of supply this will not have a limited number of supply they can create this into infinity by clicking some buttons and inputting that onto a screen even more funny they double down on this unbacked crypto assets are not money as they are high risk speculative assets well, let me just say this. If I had a choice between a CBDC and Bitcoin, I would take Bitcoin any day of the week because at least you've got the limited supply and you've got people all around the world that accept Bitcoin. Who accepts a British digital pound? Well, we'll find out in their manipulated data very shortly. Such crypto assets, the most commonly known being Bitcoin and Ether, they mean Ethereum, comprise around 90% of total market capitalization. These backed cryptos do not provide holders with a safe or stable store of value or a reliable unit of account. Hold on, are they really saying it doesn't have a reliable unit of account? Again, the person who created this does not know what they're talking about. Now, don't get me wrong here because I do own a little bit of Bitcoin myself and I do think it has its place, but I just don't like the fact that they are using lies throughout their report to say things that just aren't true. Another statement they make, uniformity and safety could be threatened by a combination of lower cash use and the emergency of some new forms of private digital money. Well, no, not really. I don't see how safety would be compromised by using something like Bitcoin, for example. And again, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm not here to, to push it in any way whatsoever. I just wanna use it as an example to compare it to this report. Now, as we scan right down to page 37 here, because the rest of this is not overly important to you. I wanna bring your attention to the consultation questions. <laughs> I mean, this is a joke. Surely this is a joke. So after all of that that we've just been through, the consultation question is this. Do you have comments on how trends in payments may evolve and the opportunities and risk that they may entail? Hold on, hold on. So the, the, the question isn't, do you have concerns about the CBDC? Do you have concerns about how there'll be no limited supply, the implementation, the drawing out of bank reserves? No, no, no none of that. The question is, do you have any comments on trends in payments may evolve 
and the opportunities and risks they may entail. Okay, that's how you know that this really isn't a consultation paper, especially because they've already given you the answer here with everything they've said beforehand. Let's go on to part C then, which is our monetary and financial stability. Depending on the speed and scale of uptake by households and businesses, the transition in particular could affect some bank business models, exactly what I said at the beginning. This could affect the cost and availability of credit in the economy, and there could also be an impact on the transition of monetary policy. Yeah, definitely. This is a huge, huge risk. I just don't know how they're gonna implement this without causing a potential crash in terms of the pound's value, unless, if you think about what happened during lockdowns, all the central banks around the world printed huge amounts of currency all at the same time, which is why you didn't see the massive fluctuations in values between currencies over a prolonged period of time. Yes, we saw it with the dollar and the euro and the, the dollar and the British pound, and we saw it going like this. It was quite out of whack for a while before it stabilized. But I'm wondering then if perhaps a lot of, especially the Western nations, will get together and they'll have a similar date in mind to actually press the launch button on this. Because if they launch at the same time and the bank deposits start to flow and move across, especially if they do it in a limited amount at first, they're going to lower the uh, dramatic effect that this will have on the economy. Or what I mentioned before, the the more extreme view is that there could be some form of a collapse or if one country had a hyperinflationary, which we're not seeing at the moment, but you could see that risk in the future. If something happened around that where they either decided they're gonna save the, the stock market or they're gonna save the economy, something like this could, could really draw this in. But I need to think a little deeper on this at this stage because they're just my initial thoughts. I haven't yet had enough time to sort of ponder on this and how everything might fit together yet. The bank does not, however, seek to preserve the status quo structure of the financial system. Okay, they're saying it there in black and white. They do not seek to preserve this current financial system. <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't even notice that the first time I read it. Or to protect any business model within the commercial banking sector from the impact of basically this central bank digital currency is what they're saying. So they're quite clear here then. When they launch this, this is gonna have an impact on the banking sector and they're not intending to protect the banking sector against this. That loss of deposits for commercial banks is known as bank disintermediation, gosh, big word there, and depending on the speed and scale, could have implications for financial stability. So again, they're telling us here in black and white. As set out in the bank's 2021 discussion paper, not much of a discussion, was it? Uh, banks losing deposits may replace them by borrowing in wholesale funding markets to maintain the same level of lending. To the extent that wholesale funding is more costly than deposits. Well, yeah, of course it's gonna be more costly than deposits. Deposits are free. When we put money into a bank now, it is free for them. They might pay us a paltry sum of interest, but in the most part, it is free for them to receive it. So if they are getting wholesale funding, it's gonna cost them more money. So what are they saying? Banks might, uh, let's replace that. Banks will pass on this in their lending. By increasing the price of credit to households and businesses or reducing the quantity of credit they're willing to supply or both. Okay, I think we need to pause there and actually discuss that as an impl implication. Because what we've got right now are these higher mortgage rates, higher loan rates, which are affecting asset prices and affecting the economy at the moment. So if we just think that this could go on for a while yet, well at the period, the point where perhaps rates could go back down lower, they're very clear here. They're saying that they're going to launch this digital currency, which means that banks would then have to get wholesale funding, meaning mortgages and loans are gonna be more expensive. So 
this is something I haven't heard anyone talk about before and I've just stumbled upon this as I'm recording this video actually. But this could mean that interest rates stay high for a long time yet. Anyone thinking that they might just drop back down to zero or you know where they've been for a long time, you might then get a surprise based on what they are saying in this paper. Diagram C.1 then, this box here really talks about the end of competition amongst banks and the end of low rates for everyone. The transition could take several years. During that period, there would be uncertainty about the extent of deposit outflows and for a given number of outflows, banks' ability to replace the lost retail funding with wholesale funding in a timely and cost-effective way. Yeah, and that is worrying because you look at the impact of the current outflows from First Republic and SVB and Signature, etc., and you saw what that did. It pretty much collapsed the banks. So if you see a major large-scale outflow across all the banks, then it's pretty much game over for the commercial banking sector. And I think they know this because they say within the monetary stability paragraph here that it might affect monetary stability. I think it will affect, and they're just using softening language as usual. And this is where I think, without going into all of this here, but this is where I think we're gonna see a lot more inflation because this would be, it says it very clearly, a new form of money for households to pay for goods and services in their daily life. So this will be on top of the current British pound as it stands. Now, another thing I, I think is very unusual, which reinforces a lot of my views here, is that they're focused not on businesses, but on individuals. They keep using the word households and individuals, but notice there isn't really much about businesses. And when we do dive into businesses, they're saying that they're not really focused on businesses in the interim term. The businesses can carry on as normal. What they're focused on is individuals. Now, you've got to ask why, if this is all about bringing stability, why would they be only focused on individuals? Surely they would be wanna focus on businesses as well, where we spend our money on a day-to-day -day basis. I do think this whole thing is getting really, really strange. The more we read into it and the more clues they give by putting out this information. The next thing they say is that the digital pound could affect the level of equilibrium interest rate with the implications for the conduct of monetary policy. The bank rate would need to be set below or above the equilibrium rate. What they are actually saying here, uh, in fact, let me finish the sentence, to return output to its productive capacity consistent with the bank's inflation target. Well, why is it the bank's inflation target? Surely it should be the, the, the economy that is in movement to set this. You see, in a normal economy, we shouldn't actually see inflation like th what the bank sets, this 2% rate. In fact, we should see deflation because of the way technology and innovation moves. As we mechanize things, wages then would drop against machinery. So what happens is people transition into new forms of work. Otherwise, if a machine can do something for the cost of two pounds an hour, well then it doesn't make sense to pay a factory worker or whatever the minimum wage is today. So here's another thing that they are not mentioning. They could, and they're saying here that they would use negative rates. So if you've got your money in the bank, they can use negative rates against you. Meaning if you've got a thousand pounds in the bank then, and they put a negative rate of 1%, that means that you're gonna lose 10 pounds just from the negative rate. So they might use this to encourage you to spend, but remember they're tracking all of your spending. Oh, you, oh, you've already had a burger this month. Well, you've fulfilled on your sort of carbon um, aspect there. You've, you've eaten your burger this month and that's not good for society as well. So that's a ding to your social credit score. I know I'm sort of half tongue in cheek here and you know this is like Black Mirror episodes if you've ever watched the series, but I don't see any reason 
based on everything I've seen in the last few years and everything I've seen in the, in the reports of the WEF, why something like this couldn't happen. Now, you know, I thought this paragraph was absolutely bizarre. So they talk about it all about stability, but then they say, the bank judges that even if there were a systemic stable coin that is backed by liabilities of the central bank and looks economically similar to the digital pound, a significant case for the digital pound would still remain. So imagine that there's some sort of a currency that is gold backed and it's all legal and all stable. They're saying that they would still launch their own digital pound. Banks may need to increase the interest they pay on their deposits by more than otherwise to avoid households moving their bank deposits into the digital pound. Well, why would you do that? Why, if you're getting, let's say, 3% interest or 2% or even 1% interest in your bank account, why would you move it into the digital pound that could have negative interest and paying zero interest? I, I just don't see why that would possibly happen. Another clue they give here is where they say, so long as cash were available, why would cash not be available? Let's jump down to section D model now then. And here's the question, why is this going to be a public private partnership? Why, why does there need to be private entities involved in this. And you know where this term comes from? It comes from the WEF. This is the term that they coined, public-private partnerships. And I've covered on a video before, which was taken down about Infosys, which is Rishi Sunak's father-in-law. So Rishi Sunak's wife, her father is a major shareholder, and I believe he was the founder. In fact, let's just check. Okay, here we go, Infosys founder was this gentleman here. And if we put in Rishi Sunak, who is the prime minister, uh, we'll probably, yeah, here we go. We found an article right away, firm founded by Rishi Sunak's father-in-law in, well, UK tax dispute. So we know Infosys is one of the companies building, they have the main contract for this digital pound. And it just happens to have been founded by his father-in-law, a pure, Coincidence, of course, there's nothing uh, unusual there. And then we have this. So the private sector would be responsible for interacting directly with end users. They would hold the customer's information as banks do now. Well, who is this private sector? Who are these entities and why are they going to be holding all of my and all of your personal information? And if we look at the model for actually involving these outside entities, whoever they are, you're going to have the central bank ledger, you've got your API layer, of course, which is where the transactions will take place. And then you have the intermediaries, the PIPs and the ESIPs. Well, who are they and what exactly are they going to be doing? Then, of course, you have the end user. Look at, <laughs> look at the image they've used here for the end user. It is the faceless gray man, of course. Who else will be involved then? there would be opportunities for businesses who do not wish to process payments. Hmm, interesting. Why would they want to get involved in this, I wonder? They can also have read access data to your information as well, to your data on the ledger. These ESIPs, these outside entities. And then we go into the revenue models. So this will be with the government, of course, but there's going to be transaction fees levied on merchants, service or transaction fees levied on, this is you, individuals. Why would there be fees? I'm not exactly sure. Commercial use of data. So this is where they are, could potentially sell your data to these pips and these other ones. There could even be subscription or product fees for value add services. Where have we heard value add before? VAT, value added tax. What about your wallet then? Well, that might also at some stage be integrated into the IoT, the internet of things. Firms from the following sectors might particularly benefit from adding a digital pound wallet to their services. Although this list is by no means exhaustive, of course it's not. Media and social media broadcasters and content sharing platforms. 
Of course, and, and what do we have at the moment? The Restrict Act going through multiple countries at the same time. Ladies and gents, if you're not getting the broader picture at this stage, then I'm not sure if you will. Even law enforcement agencies are going to be getting in on the action to want to have a look at what you've been up to, especially around public security. Uh, do you remember what happened just last week? The protesters at the anti or the anti monarchy protesters at the coronation that probably would not do well for their social credit score and their digital wallet. So none of your transactions, if we look at this box, would be anonymous because they need to actually check who you are in order to prevent financial crime. Yes, if you go and buy that chocolate bar, you could be committing a financial crime. They need to know who you are. You notice they don't say for certain payments over, let's say, a thousand pounds or something like that. No, it's all payments. Now, this report plays the classic trick, which is to wait right until the end to put in the dystopian stuff. So, here we go. The bank would place some limits on holdings of digital pounds, at least during its introductory period. An individual limit of between 10 and 20,000 pounds is proposed. So what happens then if you've got more than that? And when they implement this, it causes some sort of a run on the banks and the banks start collapsing. What happens then? And how are they going to implement this with people that have more than that in terms of their bank account? This is starting to get very worrying, but it gets worse. They're also open to looking at a lower limit, such as 5,000 pounds. Goodness me. As we finish the report, then I want to take you to page 108. So this is after all of this sort of, you know, useless information is, is done. They then, right at the end, in fact, it's at page 100 and Yes, it is, it's page 108. They then right at the end put this out, which shows you exactly what their plan is here. So this is feelings about the features of a hypothetical, <laughs> they have to put this word in, digital money account. So the feelings were that 76 or almost 77% like this digital pound. They really like it. People are very keen on it. 14% uh, dislike it, 8% unsure. If you only look at that infographic, you would assume that that is true. But when you actually look into the details here, you'll see that what they've said above is not correct. In a separate exercise, yeah, of course there was, around 20% said they found a CBDC appealing. Okay, so it wasn't the 76, almost 77% at all. It was 20% that said they, they found it appealing. 42%, however, were unsure, citing misunderstanding or lack of information. A third group, obviously they don't want to say what that percentage was, had concerns about money becoming less physical and being more reliant on the internet. So actually, it's 80% percent. The third group is 38 percent because we've got 20 percent, 42 and 38. So the third group is 80 percent who either were unsure or disapproved of the CBDC. It's not 77 percent like they are saying here. And this is what I mean about these reports and, and how it's all done here. It is pure propaganda and manipulation all the way through because they're still playing this game where, where the game is that you as the public think you have choice. We don't have any choice. This is going to be coming in anyway. The consultation paper, I mean, it, it, did you receive a consultation on this at all? I didn't. I'm pretty sure not a single person watching this video received any form of consultation on this. I would, in fact, I'm almost certain of that because they put it out. No one really knew anything about it. So at least now it sort of puts our mind at ease over, you know, the fact that we're not all conspiracy theorists and we're not all crazy about this central bank digital currency. It is in black and white. This is a government, although it came from the royal family uh, paper that's showing exactly what is going to be going on here. 
I know it was a long video today, but hopefully it was very valuable uh, to you and worthwhile. Thank you again for being a subscriber here. Take care, God bless, and I'll see you tomorrow.